Hello to everyone from Geneva, WHO headquarters. My name is Tarik and I welcome you to regular WHO virtual press conference. Uh, today's press conference is focusing on the first WHO World Report on the health of refugees and migrants. Uh, we have uh, uh, sent the report and press release under embargo to those who have requested, but uh, uh, for, for others uh, this report will be published uh, in coming uh, minutes on our website and will be also sent to the media list. We have a special guest today who will talk about this report and uh, Dr. Tedros will shortly uh, introduce them. Uh, from WHO side, uh, we have with us uh, obviously Dr. Tedros, WHO Director General, Dr. Mike Ryan, who is Executive Director of WHO Health Emergencies Program, Dr. S uh, Sumya Swaminathan, our Chief Scientist. We have Dr. Santino Severoni, who is Director of WHO Program on health and migration. Dr. Maria Van Kerkhoff, technical lead on COVID-19, is also with us, as well as Dr. Rosamund Lewis, who is technical lead on monkeypox. Number of WHO senior officials are online, and uh, we will introduce them uh, as we, uh, as we uh, proceed with the uh, question and answer session. With this, I will give the floor to Dr. Tedros for his opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Tariq. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Today, WHO is proud to launch the first world report on the health of refugees and migrants. One in every eight people on our planet is a refugee or migrant, and the numbers are growing. With conflicts, climate change, growing inequality, and global emergencies such as the COVID-19 pandemic, more and more people will be on the move. Like anyone else, refugees and migrants have the right to the highest attainable standard of health. But the health needs of refugees and migrants are often neglected or unaddressed in the countries they pass through or settle in. They face multiple barriers, including out-of-pocket costs, discrimination, and fear of detention and deportation. Many countries do have health policies that include health services for refugees and migrants, but too many are either ineffective or are yet to be implemented effectively. The WHO World Report on the Health of Refugees and Migrants is a landmark and an alarm bell. It provides a comprehensive overview of refugee and migrant health demonstrating wide disparities between the health of refugees and migrants and the wider populations in their host countries. For example, many migrant workers are engaged in the so-called 3D jobs, dirty, dangerous, and demanding, without adequate social and health protection or sufficient occupational health measures. The report also highlights a fundamental knowledge gap. Refugees and migrants are virtually absent from global surveys and health data, making these vulnerable groups almost invisible in the design of health systems and services. But it's not all bad news. The report also highlights policy trends and examples of good practices from around the world and it offers a strategic vision for a set of collective responses to protect and promote the health of migrants and refugees. We hope governments will use this report to develop evidence-informed policies and actions, and we hope advocates will use it in their efforts to call for inclusive health systems. WHO is calling on governments and organizations that work with refugees and migrants to work together and to empower them through participatory governance, to include them in the data, to prioritize them in research, and to include them in social protection schemes and financial protection in accessing health systems worldwide. Because health for all means all, including refugees and migrants. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our first guest, Professor Abdurraza Gurna, the winner of the 2021 Nobel Prize for Literature, a former refugee, 
and the signatory of today's report. Professor, it's an honor to have you here and you have the floor. Thank you very much. It's... Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I've had the opportunity to be, in some respects, in the shoes of the millions of uh, displaced people globally and have the challenge and privilege to voice their experiences. The physical, economic and psychological challenges posed by migration and displacement and integration in host communities are often misheard, overlooked or misperceived. I welcome how this report assembles available global evidence on the health of people on the move, international migrants and those forcibly displaced. How it collects this information in a single authoritative document. I'm grateful for how it shines a light on the health risks, challenges, barriers and needs these populations face every day in every corner of the world. I urge planners, policymakers, and donors alike to use the wealth of information found in this report to inform decision making. I would also like to invite them to consider the action points for governments and other stakeholders around the world to step up efforts and make good health and well being a reality for all members of society, of which refugees and migrants are an integral part. Concrete steps towards protecting and promoting the health of refugees and migrants are steps closer to our health too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. It's now my pleasure to introduce our second guest, Dr. Wahid Aryan. Dr. Aryan is a refugee medical doctor from Afghanistan who has been appointed a United Nations Global Goals goalkeeper for his work helping to deliver the sustainable development goals, including health, well-being and education. Dr. Aryan, welcome and you have the floor. Shukran for joining. Thank you very much. Um, hello everyone. It's such an honor for me uh, to be joining His Excellency Dr. Tedros and his amazing team, who's been looking after the health of the world, especially going through very challenging times. Uh, I'm a physician, I'm an author, um, I'm a humanitarian, I'm also a refugee, and all those can be possible. Um, it, as a former refugee, it gives me immense happiness to contribute to the report, which clearly highlights that the, it's the experience of migration that is key to the health and well-being of refugees and migrants, who are some of the most vulnerable people across the globe. The report details the suboptimal health determinants which contribute to poorer health outcomes uh, in refugees and migrants. I'd like to bring to life some of these suboptimal health determinants through my own story and through the story of my family going through conflict and through displacement. And that is one story out of one billion. So we have to treat each of these stories with the compassion that each one deserves. I was born in Kabul, Afghanistan during the Afghan-Soviet conflict in the 80s and spent the first five years hiding in cellars from the daily rockets, the bombs. Uh, we didn't have much food and many children, including ourselves, suffered from whooping cough. Uh, we didn't have enough clothes. And our mother will go to the market to buy some of the Western clothes, mismatched colors, to try to keep us warm in winter. And after about five years, because it was becoming too dangerous for us, we decided to migrate to Pakistan, uh, like millions of other refugees uh, that went. We had to take a very dangerous route through mountains and through valleys, because the normal borders were closed, we were not allowed to, and we had to go on donkeys and horses. Um, and that is a similar situation when we see refugees now taking very dangerous routes because they don't have another alternative. The formal routes, the official routes, as we call them, are closed 
on their faces. We came under the attack three times, miraculously survived those attacks until we made it to the refugee camp. Initially, we started residing in a tent, like so many others, and again, the temperatures were rising up to 45 degrees with one fan and a large family trying to use whatever we can to survive. And these are the sort of conditions that are ripe for several conditions, diseases, um, such as uh, malaria and tuberculosis. Uh, many of my family members, including myself, we um, got malaria, we survived that, and soon I contracted tuberculosis. That nearly killed me, but also inspired me to become a doctor. Uh, and again, the conditions that we see in refugee camps now in various parts of the world, they're not too dissimilar to the conditions that I experienced firsthand. Although we were safe from bombs, we were not physically safe, we were not socially safe, and we were not mentally safe. We went back to Kabul, Afghanistan in the 90s, and again we went through civil war, uh, which was a bloody street-by-street -street fight because of which we had to again reside in cellars hiding from the bombs and the rockets. And that's where most of my education happened because the schools were destroyed. So many of the refugees who we see, they have lost their childhood the same way as I did. They've lost access to education, which is a human right. And in 1999, when I was 15 years old, uh, that's when my life was in danger, um, both physically as well as I was seeing a threat to the hope for me to become a doctor in the future to heal. Um, my parents sent me away to the UK as a refugee. So that was another journey of refugee I had to do, take to come on my own to the UK as a 15-year-old child refugee with no family support, hardly any education, and about $100 in my pocket. But I also came with a hope with a hope to be able to live safely, to be able to study, to be able to contribute in the future. And that's how so many other refugees across the globe and immigrants, they, they come in, not only as, as, a, as a physical presence, but also with the hopes and the dreams. And despite suffering socially, not having much command of English, not being able to integrate as a result, also suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder as well. And the report clearly highlights that up to 22.1% of the population affected by conflict can be affected by mental health disorders. I was one of them. But despite all that, it was the compassion of the British people in the UK uh, that helped me to realize my dream of becoming a doctor, going on to study at Cambridge University and Harvard until I became a doctor. Again, this is one example out of one billion, and I see all these refugees and migrants as dreamers. And if we see migration from the lens of compassion, regardless of the race, regardless of their background, not through a political or a racial division lens, which sadly is happening across the globe, I believe that's how we can build and strengthen our communities, and that's also a route to be able to reorient our existing healthcare system so we can achieve universal health coverage. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Adrian. Uh, before we move to questions and answers, a few brief remarks on the COVID-19 pandemic and the global monkeypox outbreak. In the past six weeks, the global weekly number of reported cases of COVID-19 has almost doubled. Deaths are also increasing, but for the moment, uh, not as rapidly as cases. However, more cases means we can expect to see more hospitalizations and deaths in the coming weeks. There are many sublineages of the Omicron variant, most notably BA5, which is the most transmissible variant detected yet. We have said consistently that this virus will continue to evolve, and we must be ready for whatever it throws at us. That could be a new version of the variants we already know, or something completely new. We know that for any future variant to become widespread, it must be more transmissible than previous variants but we can't know how deadly it will be. So all countries must be ready. Countries that have dismantled some parts of their pandemic response systems 
are taking a huge risk. All countries have gaps. Now is the time when hospitals are not full for all countries to address those gaps in surveillance, immunity, workforce, supplies and resilience. We will see continued waves of infection, but we need not see continued waves of hospitalization and death. We have the tools to save lives, vaccines, tests, therapeutics and public health tools. Our current vaccines remain highly effective against severe disease and death. The focus in every country must be to vaccinate all health workers, all older people, and all people at, at greatest risk. We will need more vaccines that are better at protecting against infection. And if and when we get those vaccines, we cannot afford the same horrific inequity that strained the rollout of vaccines last year. On monkeypox, almost 14,000 confirmed cases have now been reported to WHO this year from more than 70 countries and territories. So far, five deaths have been reported, all in Africa. Most cases continue to be reported from Europe primarily among men who have sex with men. Although we are seeing a declining trend in some countries, others are still seeing an increase, and six countries reported their first cases last week. Some of these countries have much less access to diagnostics and vaccines, making the outbreak harder to track and harder to stop. WHO is validating, procuring, and shipping tests to multiple countries and will continue to provide support for expanded access to effective diagnostics. One of the most powerful tools we have against monkeypox is information. The more information people at risk of monkeypox have, the more they are able to protect themselves. That's why WHO is continuing to work with patients and community advocates to develop and deliver information tailored to the affected communities and more likely to be accepted and implemented. This week, WHO updated its guidance for men who have sex with men to include additional advice and information for the affected community. Tomorrow, the International Health Regulations Emergency Committee will reconvene to review the latest data and to consider whether the outbreak constitutes a public health emergency of international concern. Regardless of the committee's recommendation, WHO will continue to do everything we can to support countries to stop transmission and save lives. Tariq, back to you. Thank you, Dr. Tedros. Uh, thank you, Professor Gurnar, and thank you, Dr. Arian, for these opening remarks. Uh, uh, let me tell you who is uh, or who should be online from WHO side uh, and uh, who uh, also may answer some questions. Uh, we should have with us uh, Dr. Zuzana Jakab, Deputy Director General, uh, Dr. Mariangela Simao, who is Assistant Director General, Access to Medicine, Dr. Sosefal is uh, Assistant Director General for Emergency Response. Uh, with us should also be Dr. Kate O'Brien, Director for Immunization, and also Dr. Maria Neira, who is the Director of our Department on, on Environment, Climate Change, and Health. Um, this press conference has a simultaneous interpretation into six UN languages, Portuguese and Hindi. So if journalists want to ask questions in those languages, Please welcome to do so. Now we will start with the with questions, and first we will go to Simon Ateba from Today News Africa. Simon, please unmute yourself. Thank you, Tariq, for taking my question. This is Simon Ateba with Today News Africa in Washington. The WHO says the case fatality rate for the Marburg virus disease recently identified in Ghana can be up to 88%, depending on the strain and other factors. That's pretty high. That's almost like a death sentence. 
Can you tell us more about the recent outbreak in Ghana and the spread of the mad bird virus disease now around the world and whether it should be a case for concern? Uh, concern and what the WHO is doing to contain it. I know that the White House said yesterday that the US official are in close collaboration with WHO official and those in Ghana. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Uh, do we have uh, Dr. Fall with us? Uh, Dr. Fall? Uh, thank you for the question. This is a very important question. Let me first of all ask that we have a number of countries in the African region which are in the ecological niche of the virus, which is very close to Ebola. We have at least 20 countries at least for the virus outbreak. So the last outbreak we had was in 2021 in Guinea. So far in Ghana, two cases have been identified and uh, the diagnosis has been confirmed and the sequencing also shows that this one is the same we have had in Guinea last year. WSO is working with Ghana government and partners for investigation, contact tracing to make sure that we can stop the transmission early enough. You know. The virus can be very deadly if nothing is done. Unfortunately for Marburg, there is no vaccine compared to Ebola, where we have now two vaccine, vaccines but uh, making sure that we identify contact early in of isolated cases and we provide supportive treatment we help to improve you know the survival rate so early diagnostic and isolation early treatment we help people to survive of course if nothing is done the case fatality rate will be very high let me also highlight that we are working very hard as a priority in our research and development for Hyped pathogen to develop therapeutics and vaccine for for Marburg. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fall. So uh, we will go to the next question. We have Elaine Fletcher from Health Policy Watch. Elaine. Thank you for taking my question on the report, um, Dr. Tedros on migrants and refugees. Uh, you said uh, it's one out of eight people on the planet. I think the news page says one out of seven. So if you can just clarify that factoid. And then in addition, if you could tell us what proportion of migrants and refugees have access to some kind of health coverage. Is there is there some sort of single number that gives us an idea of that gap um, in the report? Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Maybe uh, Dr. Severoni could, uh, could address those questions. Thank you, Tariq. Um, regarding the access to services, indeed, particularly during the uh, initial phase of COVID outbreak, we've been analyzing the policy setting of all member states in terms of including or not including refugees and migrants in the uh, response uh, measures. And uh, in, a, in a simple, simplifying number, about one third of the countries worldwide, they use an approach of uh, promoting universalistic approach, universal health coverage and primary health care uh, approach. Uh, the majority of the country, although they opted for temporary solutions, so solutions put in place uh, due to the necessity of uh, facing the uh, reality at the moment, but also with probably an intention and uh, possibility to go back to the setting prior to the crisis. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Severni. Uh, maybe uh, our guests would like to add something uh, on, on this topic. Maybe Dr. Arian and Professor Guggenheim, if you would like to add something on the accessibility of, uh, of health care to, to migrants and refugees. Um, thank you. Um, I would like to add that um, we've seen it uh, throughout the COVID pandemic that uh, access to healthcare uh, for refugees in particular, um, sadly, is not uniform. Uh, so it, it varies from country to country, it varies from region to region, and that's where all the other um, health determinants come into play. So when we're talking about health, if we look at it from more from the social, physical, and the mental uh, well-being perspective, we'll be able to see that 
And there are so many factors in, that are interplay. And in my view, it, in achieving universal health coverage, uh, if you look at refugees and migrants as a whole, rather than just look at, for example, if they're catching COVID or not catching COVID, or they're um, at risk of uh, one disease or another. Uh, so we are ignoring everything else that's going around them. Uh, and that's why this report is uh, uh, amazingly so extensive that it identifies and highlights and puts a foundation in place on which we can base our research, our um, contributions, and how the policies um, are changed in the future. So we can revisit it again and see how much of a progress we've made. One of the, uh, I think, important suggestions that the report makes is for increased surveillance of the condition of the migrants and refugees when they, when they arrive or indeed as they are uh, moving towards uh, their destinations. Uh, many of them, of course, either as a result of uh, the, uh, the poor conditions from which, I mean, health provision conditions from which they're leaving or the uh, difficulties of the journeys they have to make uh, arrive with already severe problems, health problems. And these are not uh, known or they are disguised or they are not even acknowledged perhaps by the uh, refugees themselves. So one of the recommendations is precisely to, uh, to sharpen that uh, surveillance of the, of the conditions of the, of the refugees and migrants. Many thanks, uh, Professor Gugner, uh, Dr. Severoni, and Dr. Arian. Uh, let's uh, try to go to the next question. We have uh, Mega from uh, Geneva Solutions. Uh, Mega, could you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, thank you. Uh, there were many social determinants that was mentioned in the report. Um, in your study, was there any single biggest factor among the social determinants that you had mentioned that has affected access to healthcare among refugees and migrants? Was there any single biggest factor? Thank you. Uh, Mega, could you just like uh, slowly repeat the question that the line was not the best? Uh, if I understood well, it was about uh, a social uh, uh, and economic determinants. Reasons. Determinants. Uh, can I repeat the question? Yes, please. Okay. Um, there were many social determinants that affect access to healthcare um, that were mentioned in the report. I was just wondering uh, if the team um, had, if the team had discovered any single biggest factor among those determinants that affected access to healthcare among refugees and migrants. Thank you, Mega. This time it was clear. Uh, Dr. Severoni, would you, would you like? No, it's never a, a result of a single uh, determinant. Indeed, the legal framework, the definition of the group on, the mo on movement might be a, a major limitation. Those are uh, people that government they tend to um, identify through a legal definition. So the regularity or irregularity tend to determine the level of uh, uh, entitlement, they are uh, level of access to health systems and possible entitlement. This is probably the most important barrier. But uh, this is also um, uh, mixing with uh, issues related to cultural, linguistic uh, barrier, and also element of uh, competency of the healthcare workers while they have to uh, face possible health needs related to this population. Uh, many thanks. Um, we may now uh, try to go to the next question. It's uh, John Zaracostas, who uh, writes for Lancet. John? Yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you. I'd like to uh, perhaps uh, get from the experts uh, some more details on the very high levels of self-harm among migrants and refugees, and also the very high levels of post-stress disorder uh, of refugees in some very advanced and affluent European countries. What is the reason that your research has shown for that? Thank you. Thank you, John. Well, we have, uh, we have our three uh, experts here. So who would like to start maybe? 
Well, there is an element which came out pretty strong out of the report that uh, particularly those which they managed to resettle down in a country of destination, migrants or refugees, they tend to be widely involved into um, jobs which are mostly, uh, as defined before, 3D jobs, so dirty or, or labor type of uh, activities which are highly exposing to uh, occupational uh, injuries. There are studies which they proved that about 40% of the population which has been uh, surveyed, sample, has been reporting at least one accident related to uh, their own uh, condition of, of employment. There is another element which is playing particular importance in the um, self-infliction or even uh, mental uh, issues related to the process uh, around the migratory, uh, the migration phenomenon. Uh, detention is still widely utilized as a methodology, methodology of management of migration, particularly um, in the case of uh, irregular migrations or those which are willing to get the protection and uh, they are forced to use the asylum seeking. And uh, detention has been uh, shown in the report to be a, a terrible uh, trigger for risk of uh, uh, mental disorders, depressor, depression, anxiety, and also self inflictions of uh, uh, trauma and uh, lesions or mutilation also in certain cases. This is a widespread phenomenon, particularly if you take into consideration that the migration journey in certain cases can be also long two, three years. And uh, the transiting in those called uh, technically or in jargon uh, tra transiting countries or countries which are hosting uh, the population while trying to reach the destination uh, also are um, often uh, managing these flows with a, a wide use of, uh, of detentions or rejection of, the, of these people towards the borders. Thank you very much. Um, just to highlight, um, from my own experience as a physician working in the National Health Service in the UK as an emergency doctor, but also as a humanitarian working with refugees, that the PTSD that we see amongst refugees or other mental health disorders such as extreme anxiety or depression, uh, it's actually the accumulation of many levels of traumas over many months and years. It's not a sudden phenomenon that they arrive somewhere and they get this disorder that we see. Um, examples I give through my own story of displacement, but others who are going through conflict through displacement by abandoning their family members, their loved ones, the social protective factors which uh, are uh, enhancing their mental well-being and then you're putting them in a place where they don't have those preventative mechanisms in place and if they've been through traumas, they come to a situation where they are suffering and they're suffering extensively. And on the other hand, they are either not screened for mental health problems, they're not understood well because of the language, because of the social barriers. Um, and in many instances, they have to go in hiding um, or they're put in detention centers or they go in hiding because of uh, the political reasons, whether the cases have not been resolved or have been rejected. And they try to live uh, in, in extremely unkept conditions. So it's, it's accumulation of many factors that contribute to it. But how do we make sure that uh, we reach to a position where we can actually help these people? Uh, and that is, should be the question that we should be asking policymakers. Um, maybe, uh, pro Professor, would you like to add something? Well, I don't think I, I have anything to add so far as uh, that issue of the mental health of the refugees. I think these two have, uh, <clears throat> in various ways, great experience of that. But I was trying to remember the second half of that question about rich countries. I wonder if it, we could have it again. Is it possible? The, the question? That the was second, there, was a, there was a second ah, part. Uh, do we have a John online? John, can you unmute yourself uh, and if you can? Yes, hi, yes. 
Yes, I was interested uh, from your research why you had uh, very high cases of uh, PTSD uh, among migrants and refugees living in some very affluent northern European countries. Uh, what, are, what is the research showing? Is it the elements that the doctor just mentioned or is it also rejection by the host society? Uh, well, I will just say that it seems to me, not speaking professionally as somebody working in medicine, that uh, a lot of responsibility for the kind of neglect that has been mentioned uh, by my two colleagues here is, um, it, it seems to me, p part of what the establishment, the authorities, the governments uh, decide to do, driven, no doubt, by some kind of desire to, uh, to address uh, a kind of populist opinion that says we're not being taken advantage of or something of this kind. You're quite right that uh, these are prosperous societies and at times it seems as if they're not acting as humanely as they might. Yeah, just to confirm, probably the right answer is both uh, elements are contributing to an increased detection of, of uh, traumatic, uh, post-traumatic stress. Indeed, the migra migra migration experience, but also the level of inclusion of, uh, of uh, um, yeah, social inclusion at the uh, place of destination. This is probably the most uh, complex challenge that a newcomers and new arrival need to face while resettling in the destination. And uh, the mental health uh, correlation are pretty well documented. Many thanks. Uh, let's uh, move to the next question. We have Arshwin from Observer Times India. Arshwin? Uh, thank you for considering my question. Uh, it is a worth remembering. It is a worth remembering to Martin Luther King in an address to the Second National Convention of the Medical Committee of Human Rights in 1996. That is, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in the health care is the most shocking and inhuman. It's, it is remains to be three years later. My question is how far, how further we have been achieved to provide health care facilities for migrants and refugees as the number of migrants and refugees are increasing from the past decades of the year. Thank you. Thank you, Arshwin. The, the line was a bit broken at the beginning, but I think we got a question, and it's how far we got into ensuring uh, access to, uh, to health care for migrants and, 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 and refugees. So maybe uh, Dr. Severoni can, can start. This is the objective of uh, uh, our work and uh, WHO commitment. I have to say that uh, one element which came out pretty interestingly in the findings of the report is that although we are still far away from an ideal situation, in reality this is a changing world. Uh, since few years ago when the element of uh, migration or the health aspect of uh, migration that were almost not considered by the health sector of many countries, uh, today the reality is completely changed. The health issues are uh, equally uh, and the migration issues are on top of the political agenda of, of most of the uh, governments. Although the topic remains controversial, often politicized and polarizing, but indeed countries, they are showing a better understanding, uh, commitment, and pledging interventions in order to improve the uh, situation of uh, protection of migrants and granting access to essential services, including health. I repeat, this is not yet an ideal situation. Unfortunately, we are having still many reality which are uh, very difficult, very concerning, but also the overall macro picture is uh, somehow encouraging because uh, something happened and many countries are uh, probably um, showing a different level of commitment and understanding of the importance of this issue. 
I would just like to um, actually reiterate what Dr. Savroni has just mentioned, that um, although there are many areas we can improve upon, but there is hope and there is progress, in my view, even as a, as a physician. Um, I've seen it um, at the level of the service providers, the many doctors and nursing staff across the globe with whom we partner through charity organization or globally, they are acutely aware of the varying needs of migrants and refugees. And they talk about it in conversations, whether it's formal or informal. Uh, and that is a, a very, I would say, constructive position to be in on which we should build uh, from top to bottom. And I think policy, of course, is extremely important from the top, but then translating and connecting the bottom approach at the level of the service providers, in my view, is extremely also important. How to translate, for example, this report into action, how to translate uh, that in, not only into policy, but into tangible gains on the ground. Uh, thank you, Dr. Severoni and uh, Dr. Arian. Uh, I'm just looking uh, into um, into chat. Uh, we got a question on monkeypox, uh, and sorry, I didn't really. I'm not able to read the name right now uh, of the of the reporter. Uh, and the question is: In the light of monkeypox outbreak, what are the top several points of advice that people need to have right now to protect themselves and people around them? So I don't know, Dr. Lewis, if you could address this question. Thank you very much, Tariq. Uh, well, it's an excellent question. So the many points of advice, uh, number one is uh, communication, right? So uh, information to the people who need to have the information to protect themselves. That is the possibly uh, the, the most important one. Um, at the moment, we are seeing a very um, mixed pattern of transmission in some parts of the world, uh, such as uh, parts of Africa, Western Central Africa, but in other countries all around the world, 99% of cases reported are among men. So it is men who are at risk right now, not all men. 98% um, of those that are reported are among men who have sex with men, and primarily those who have multiple recent anonymous uh, or new partners. So it's a question of really understanding what the risk is for an individual, what our individual uh, risk of exposure, the choices we make, and this is particularly important because people do want this information. People want the information to know how to protect themselves, in what circumstances are people perhaps at risk or, or getting infected. So for example, uh, the WHO is working extensively with representatives of affected communities, working extensively with uh, members of uh, organizations that are, that are uh, having festivals, organizing pride, celebrations. These are all important celebrations of identity. It is also very important that those uh, venues and events and activities share information for people to protect themselves. We have heard today that the um, coverage of information in some of these events remains patchy, that some event organizers uh, and, and festivals are sharing this information very broadly and others may not be, and uh, there may be different reasons for that. But we are urging all uh, health authorities and all community organizers to engage uh, with the affected community to find out how they would like the information presented, how they would like to receive the information. And then the second message is, of course, is that there are uh, ways to protect oneself beyond uh, simply being aware of the risk, which is the most important, but also in terms of access to services, access to uh, testing, uh, finding out where tests are available and, and how they can best be taken, finding out uh, where vaccines possibly may be available and how they can best be accessed as well, uh, finding out uh, what are the right measures to protect people around you, such as um, uh, people who do have monkeypox, have confirmed case of monkeypox and have symptoms, should remain uh, isolated at home to protect their families uh, and uh, uh, other contacts that they, other people they may be in contact with in future. So these are just a few of the messages. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, we continue to work with all uh, engaged parties uh, on this very important issue. Um, th thanks, Rosman. Thank you've really laid it out there extremely well. Um, uh, and I, I, I think that that issue of focusing on this disease is transmissible. 
but it's not that transmissible. It's a disease in which transmission can be contained, and we can, like we said in COVID, don't be the person to pass this disease on. It doesn't matter what group you're in. If you have this, if you have the lesions, if you can get tested, if you can't get tested, and you suspect that you have monkeypox, don't pass it on. Uh, the community that's currently been infected is one of the most engaged, powerful, responsible communities that we have uh, who have really worked so hard over many years to contain an even more deadly virus. Uh, so therefore we have full confidence that this community uh, can and will and is engaging very closely in order to, to do that. We also need in the broader public health community is to keep an eye on other population subgroups which we are doing. Uh, we've said that before, we're keeping a very close surveillance uh, around this virus. But also we need to think that this transmission is occurring in has been occurring in African countries in two particular zones over a large number of years and we don't fully understand what's driving transmission in those countries and there's a lot more investigation to do and a lot more investment to make in understanding that problem or else we, like with COVID uh, and pandemics, we're destined to repeat these things if we don't understand their origins, we don't understand their drivers. So we have two jobs of work to do. We have to work very closely with the community that's currently affected to ensure that they have the empowerment, that they have the resources, they have the knowledge to contain this disease, uh, that we keep an eye on and, and make sure that other population groups are not affected. And we work with countries that are affected with zoonotic transmission and onward transmission. And I think that's one of the issues, and Rosamond, I know You've said this many times. We have patterns of transmission in places like Ghana and in Nigeria that are actually aren't purely zoonotic. There is human-to-human -human transmission that has occurred and does occur, not explosively, but it does occur in those environments. So we have a lot of knowledge to gain uh, in, the, in the coming months. Uh, a lot of work to do uh, and a lot of uh, investment to make both in the communities affected by this disease but in the science of understanding this and Samia and myself and the research and development blueprint team with Rosamond's team and, and others also working very hard on the research agenda for both vaccines and drugs for these for this disease. Just wanted to add uh, to what Mike said about um, monkeypox uh, vaccines and therapeutics R&D. The R&D blueprint team has been working with uh, scientists and colleagues, uh, academics around the world, and uh, there is now a core protocol that's been developed um, to use um, the available vaccines in a clinical trial in, in affected uh, countries amongst the exposed populations to actually test the efficacy of these vaccines because this has not been done and this is a good opportunity for us and again because of the communities uh, that's been uh, the involved the population that's involved is, is very much um, has been a partner in research and development for um, HIV therapeutics for example over many years and have advocated for the uh, testing and development of, uh, of countermeasures. And so it would be really good if uh, research funders could come together right now to really prioritize the uptake of uh, such a platform <coughs> trial that could be run across multiple countries using the same endpoints and the same interventions and the same definitions so that one could have uh, the uh, added advantage of having um, results on the use of uh, both the therapeutic as well as uh, vaccines that may be currently being used in countries, but um, this is an opportunity we shouldn't miss. And I, I, I do think that um, if we've learned something from uh, the COVID pandemic is that there was a lot of research that was done around the world which did not add a lot of value. There were a lot of clinical trials funded that did not answer the question, whereas there were a few platform trials that were done that did actually answer the question of whether or not a particular drug reduced mortality from uh, from COVID. So just learning from that, I would imagine that this is the right time to really, for the research funders in particular, but also communities to engage in uh, taking on trials and again, doing it across countries, across continents, so that we have um, robust data uh, that, that could then result in uh, in the licensing of these products for this particular indication, as well as uh, drive more innovative uh, products. So as far as WHO is concerned, we have the target product profiles that have been developed and also core protocols. And I think it's now for the scientific community to come together um, to take it forward. Thanks to uh, all of you.
And maybe one more question uh, before we close. We have Zainab Hussein from British Medical Journal. Uh, Zainab, uh, please unmute yourself and uh, go ahead. Hi. Um, my first question, sorry, I have two questions. My first question is, could you please give us some examples of what kind of urgent and collective action that we need to do to ensure that refugees and migrants can access the health and care services that are sensitive to their needs in particular? And my second question, if possible, if you could answer, please, um, is how could we improve the quality, the relevance and the completeness of the health data on refugees and migrants? Thank you. Uh, and Dr. Severoni, do you want to, to, to get the question repeated? Yes, please. Uh, Zainab, can you please repeat the question because Dr. Severoni was, 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 did not hear it properly? Yes, of course. Is that both questions? Uh, yes, but please repeat b both questions, please. Yep, sure. So my first question is, what kind of urgent and collective action do we need to ensure that refugees and migrants access health and care services that are sensitive to their needs? Um, what kind of examples, maybe? Um, and the second question is, how can we improve the health data that we have on refugees and migrants to make sure that the quality is better and that they're more relevant um, and more helpful to us? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think, uh, I think Dr. Dr. Severoni and our guests uh, have, have heard the question now. I'm starting with a, a second part related to data. Uh, indeed, the reality we are observing is that it's not that we are having absence of data, but mostly we are confronting with a uh, set of data not comparable, fragmented, uh, difficult to be offered to support uh, rational policy speculation or formulation or to detect trends of uh, um, situations at country level. So um, certainly this is a priority area to invest into encouraging countries to start to collect or to improve the collection of data, try to collect disaggregated data, not only by gender, but also by migratory status. Uh, and this is a um, still very embryo stage, I will say, in most, of, in most of the countries. The element of data is not the only part. We are realizing that still there is need to invest into quality research in order to produce evidence which is uh, um, more um, useful to understand what are the dynamics in relation to uh, access the systems, what are the barriers which are playing an important role in uh, preventing uh, this group of populations to, uh, to access the services and the health systems. Uh, indeed, as I mentioned previously, and this is the first part of your question, probably the most concern is the legal framework. Um, if we are observing the dynamic of population movement, uh, the uh, request of protection of asylum, unless particular cases, like we have seen, for example, uh, in the, uh, with, the, with the Ukrainian crisis, it's a process which requires the uh, requesting of protection to show up at the country of destination and ask this protection. Uh, usually this is a process that can take one year or even two years to be completed from the receiving countries, where during this period the person is a, an asylum seeker, uh, usually uh, not having full access to the health system, but there are ad hoc services made available for centers dealing with uh, asylum seekers. Um, the uh, re person requesting protection, if fell in the process of uh, requesting protection, might be rejected. And in many cases, those are becoming irregular migrants. And the case of uh, irregularity is a major, major obstacle for the individual to uh, request support and assistance. We have run uh, a Again, a survey to, to see what is the perception in terms of accessing the uh, health system by 30,000 interview refugees and migrants worldwide. And it was interesting that the uh, fear of deportation was the reason reported by 37% of the interviewed. Uh, 
and then close to 30% for incapability to face the cost associated with uh, uh, purchasing the medical assistance uh, needed. And uh, um, not secondary, the difficulty to navigate the systems, the health systems, the difficulty to capture the necessary information in order to identify where to uh, go to receive support and uh, access to the uh, service health support needed. Those factors, those elements should be addressed in a regular manner without a policy, a sound policies supported by solid facts, data and evidence uh, is difficult that can address uh, those barriers. And indeed the uh, element of healthcare workforce is central. Um, the um, competency of the healthcare workforce is an essential element. Again, studies with, that we've been uh, observed, observing with the report clearly identify that the um, capacity of the healthcare workers to understand and to communicate and to uh, provide the needed attention to uh, those type of uh, patients that were uh, essential according to their own perception of support and, and, and uh, uh, health assistance. So the element of investing into undergraduate or continuous education for healthcare workers is also an important element in strengthening quality of healthcare mm -hmm. service for refugees and migrants. Um. Would you like to add something, Dr. Arian? Um, I just want to add, I think uh, it's coming from a colleague from the British Medical Journal, and I think the specific want Lee to ask some examples. Uh, one thing I would ask to doc, um, add to Dr. Savroni has mentioned is the urgent collective action that we can take is screening. Screening for both physical and mental health conditions. This is something that not only leads to treatment, but also leads is extremely important to prevention. Many of these migrants and refugees who come in, they come in with various levels or various uh, chronic diseases, um, from heart conditions to, to so many others. But they also come in with PTSD, severe anxiety and depression. So if we don't screen them, and, and sadly I work in the NHS and, and it doesn't happen in many other countries as well, I'm not picking just on the NHS, it is that sort of at the point level of screening or somewhere that they can come in and confidently without the fear of being persecuted, without the fear of being, the data being used against them, objectively, just for the sake of their health care, they're reassured that come in and we would like to have a chat with you. They're assessed by clinical psychologists, by general practitioners, not for them to wait to the point where they have a crisis, where they self-harm, whether they have a heart attack or whether they have many other problems and then we pick up the pieces in the emergency department and that's how we overburden the healthcare system because we are not getting it right right at the start. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Arian. And I understand there is a specific question from uh, one of our uh, uh, viewers online for Professor Gurnach. So it's uh, Tami Haltman from All Africa. Tami, please, uh, please unmute yourself. Yes, did the unmute work? Uh, yes. Okay, thanks. Professor Gurna, I wonder if you could comment on the role of creative culture and media in communicating health information among refugees, especially survivors of conflict across Africa. I guess, I guess you could write a book about, uh, about that as a way of illustrating uh, the difficulties people go through. I think that kind of work already exists. Um, I think what, is, what this report does, and indeed those last two responses that uh, were very, very eloquent in identifying what the problem is and what needs to be done when it concerns the, uh, um, I suppose, diagnosing and uh, surveilling and being aware of the needs of uh, refugees. Um, yeah, if you search the, uh, uh, the the libraries, as it were, there are many creative works that people are writing about these things now from different positions. Um, so I don't think there's any kind of special answer that I can give, except that they're there. Um, some of them perhaps not quite so well known, or they're on the internet, or there are works that are produced by um, uh, activist bodies 
but there are plenty of uh, creative accounts that try to capture and to disseminate the experience uh, of migration and refugees. Thank you, uh, Professor Gugner and uh, uh, Dr. Arian, as well. Uh, thanks to all of other uh, WHO speakers who were with us uh, today. This will conclude our press briefing uh, for uh, July 20th. Uh, and then uh, we will, as always, send uh, to reporters audio and video file from this briefing, and hopefully transcript will be posted on our website tomorrow morning. Uh, with this, uh, I give the final word to Dr. Tedros. Thank you, thank you, Tariq. Um, again, I would like to thank uh, our Nobel laureate, Professor Abdul Raza uh, Gurna, for joining us today, and also to Dr. Wahid uh, Aryan. So thank you, thank you so much indeed, and uh, I know you will continue to be the voice of uh, refugees and, and migrants who deserve our attention, our collective attention. Um, then there was one um, issue, I think, um, a specific question, I don't know if it was addressed, but uh, the first, must be the first uh, journalist who asked whether the true uh, figure is one in seven or one in eight migrants, I mean uh, people who are uh, uh, migrants. Uh, I checked that, and in my statement, it's one in eight. In the report, it's one in eight. So please take the one in eight people are migrants. Um, then the last part, what can we do um, you know, for refugees, migrants to access health care? I think the report covers it. Uh, uh, but if we take just one key issue, um, it, it's, it's political. So it's a matter of for the political leaders in, in every country uh, to make a decision to show political uh, commitment to address the barriers that refugees and migrants are facing. It could be a legal one, it could be administrative, it could be financial. And to, to treat them uh, humanely by addressing uh, their problems and for that to happen, I think including it in their national policies, uh, programs, uh, will be really key. And that's what we will continue to advocate. So this is a political issue and the political leaders uh, should uh, address it. If that's addressed, I think the rest could be okay. The financial, the other barriers could be okay. As long as the political leaders are receptive or welcoming refugees and migrants uh, for human beings, I think movement is, uh, you know, a tradition or it's in our DNA. Uh, we have been moving for, for, for millennia. Uh, and um, even countries um, uh, who prided themselves of not having any refugees because of conflict or other problems are now becoming major contributors of refugees and migrants. And any country could be in the same same state. Probably those who are stable now could have contributed more in, in, in the past. So it it, it it rotates that we will not stay the same way. So we will be guests today or we will be receiving guests tomorrow. It, it, it's for everyone. So when we do it, we do it for ourselves. We do it for, 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 for humanity because as human beings, we are vulnerable. Anything can happen that can move us out of our uh, places. Uh, we would be forced to leave uh, our places and treating each other in a humane way will, will be very important because we, we maybe could be hosts today, but we may look for hosts uh, tomorrow. Uh, so let's be kind to each other. That's what we, 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 we're saying. And refugees and migrants need need protection because it's human behavior to move and we can end up being one any day and um, it's it's a humanity issue and also a political issue that should be addressed by political leaders and i hope our political leaders will read our our report and um, do their best to help refugees and and migrants wherever uh, the, the, they are. And doing that, it's not just for the refugees and migrants. Uh, we should also know that 
the hosts also um, it, it also benefits the host the host countries in in many ways i don't want to go into that but when you help refugees and migrants you're not just doing it for them but you're doing it for yourself i mean the host countries um, and uh, that's why uh, doing it the right way is uh, actually um, you know a plus uh, for 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 everybody, for the refugees and migrants, or for the host country. So thank you so much to our uh, members of the press for joining us uh, today, uh, and see you next time.